Christianity was born in a culture that was Hellenistic. What does that mean? Aristotle's student, Alexander the Great, conquered a large part of the known world. Everything from Greece all the way to the boundaries of India, and including the Middle East and much of North Africa. Alexander's conquests spread Greek culture, Greek religion, Greek philosophy, the Greek language, throughout that entire region. And so there was a kind of culture that arose out of that. It was heavily Greek, Greek influenced in many different respects, but on the other hand was highly multicultural. Many different ethnic groups, many different religions practiced within that empire. And so we tend to think of individual parts of that Hellenistic region as relatively isolated, but it wasn't really true. There was a common language, Greek, throughout that entire area. There was, moreover, a great deal of commerce, a great deal of travel. And once the Roman Empire swept through much of it, that changed even more dramatically, because the Romans did many things well, but the main thing they did well was engineering. They built roads, they built buildings. And their roads connected these parts of the empire, not only to Greece, but also to Rome. So travel within this area became much easier than it had been before. There was a common language, a common culture, a common civilization, and easier transportation than people had ever had before. So we tend to think of these regions as isolated, but really they weren't very isolated at all. And indeed, first and second century authors indicate that even though they might be in the Christian tradition, they're familiar with Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, and a variety of other cults and sects and religions throughout that entire region. The Hellenistic world, then, was highly cosmopolitan. And within that larger region, there was an area of the Middle East, including Palestine, where people spoke Aramaic. Aramaic had been the language of the Assyrian Empire, also the Neo-Babylonian Empire, and it was something that was spoken all the way from the boundaries of Persia to the Mediterranean. Despite the Roman conquest, that part of the empire was still largely Hellenistic. Greek remained the common language, which is why the New Testament, a series of books written about a group of people who were speaking Aramaic, nevertheless is written in Greek. Let's talk some about the philosophical background of that Hellenistic era. Plato and Aristotle by this time had relatively little influence. Plato's academy had become skeptical within a generation or two after his death, and so Platonism was submerged for a long time, and only gradually began to reassert itself around the first century. Aristotle, too, faded in significance. His works would be rediscovered later, had a kind of renaissance in the first century as well, but on the other hand, Aristotle was not a very significant influence throughout most of the Hellenistic period. The three major schools of philosophical thought were the Epicureans, the Stoics, and the Skeptics. They disagreed on many types of questions, but they did agree on basic questions about, well, the three major areas of philosophy. I think the three most important questions of philosophy are, what is there, how do we know, and what do we do about it? The first question, what is there, is the basic question of metaphysics. And there the Stoics, Skeptics, and Epicureans all tended to agree. What there is, is material. In modern terms, they were all more or less physicalists. Now I say more or less because the Stoics tended to believe in a creator-type god, but that creator god was vaguely described. The view was we couldn't really know much about that being. The Epicureans were atheists. The, the skeptics, while well, thinking it was impossible to know anything, tended simply to be agnostics. Not only agnostics about the existence of God, but agnostics more or less about everything. In any case, there was a materialistic foundation. So the culture of the Hellenistic world was largely materialist, largely physicalist. Now, I don't mean materialistic in the sense of questing after material goods. I mean simply thinking of the world as consisting of material objects. There is no soul. If there is a god, well, 
we can't know much about them. And so all we've really got is the world around us, the physical world. Secondly, the question of epistemology or the theory of knowledge. How do we know? The answer is, well, through our senses. Epicureans, Stoics, skeptics, all agree to that to the extent that we can know anything at all. We know it through our senses, through observation. So all of them assume a kind of empiricism. There's nothing like the realm of platonic forms that can be known through reflection or dialectic. All we have are the material objects around us and the perceptions of them. That is what generates whatever knowledge we can have. And for the skeptics, well, there is not much of any knowledge that we can have. The other groups thought we could know more, but all agreed it would be on the basis of observation. Finally, what should we do? Well, if the only thing that is real is the material, the physical, and the only way we can know about it is through perception, through experience, then what follows is that the foundation for value must be something that's available to our senses. It must be something we can experience. So pleasure and pain, the sensation of pleasure, the sensation of pain, or maybe in the Stoic way of thinking, it's more a, an absence of sensation, a kind of tranquility or peace of mind. That is what's important in ethics. We are either in quest of pleasures, as the Epicureans thought, or at least trying to avoid pains, as the Stoics thought. And so there is no other transcendent source of value. Value arises out of our own perceptions of the material world. 